we're live. Great, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to everybody to the next in our ongoing seminar series um, for the Lancet Commission on Gender and Global Health. My name is Sarah Hawkes. I'm uh, sitting in the UK. I'm one of the co-chairs of, of the commission, along with my two other fabulous co-chairs, uh, Professor uh, Pascal Alotti, sitting at the United Nations University in Kuala Lumpur, and Mr. Assi, who is chair of the Kofi Annan Foundation, is in Dakar, Senegal. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome today our Commissioner um, Khadija Moala, who is a, an incredibly experienced um, expert in gender equality, human rights, and the practice thereof. So um, Khadija is uh, sitting in Tunisia right now, has up until very recently um, spent the best part of the past two years working on issues of gender equality and human rights uh, in Iraq. And I assume that we'll be talking to some of that experience, but we'll also be talking about her decades long experience of the practice of the legal aspects of law and human rights around, and gender equality um, throughout her career. This, it, this um, seminar is being brought to you on YouTube, <laughs> but we're actually all sitting on Zoom, such as the power and the wonder of technology. But it does mean we can't actually see or, uh, your questions unless you type them into the chat box under the YouTube uh, screen. So if you have got any questions for Khadija as we go along or when her talk is finished, please do type them into, into the screen under, un, under the YouTube channel, and we will be able to then convey those to Khadija. Khadija, thank you very much, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, and thanks to colleagues, thanks to Emma and Anna for your support. Uh, it's really an honor and pleasure to share with you a few thoughts um, that I gathered from my uh, 30 years of experience trying to work and serve uh, women um, in many, many countries, but mostly in the Arab region and in uh, many African countries. So I have a PowerPoint and I will share my screen so that I can uh, walk you through uh, these, uh, the ideas that I would like to share. Okay. So I hope that you see the, um, the big screen. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I assume that you have the screen in front of you. So to this uh, today, I would like to um, reflect with you, in fact, on uh, gender equality and essentially on why the message is not getting across to community. Uh, again, it's just uh, about my experience uh, working with and for uh, women and men also. Uh, so I would like to follow Einstein's uh, advice, uh, who uh, tell us to raise new questions, new possibilities, to regard old problems from a new angle, requires creative imagination and marks real advance in science. This is why I wanted really to raise a few new questions and essentially to ask why do we still have gender inequality that justifies violation of women's rights in our societies? And to be able to answer that question, I would like to uh, look for the communities, uh, look for them, where are they, through the lenses of the spiral dynamic frame. So the spiral dynamic has been invented by Claire Graves and Don Beck. And the spiral model is central to the spiral dynamic. It includes eight levels of developments, and each of the eight levels relates to a cultural, psychological, and the cognitive reality for human beings. I will focus only on the first six levels of development, uh, but in a very simplified way, in order to reflect on the hindrances we collectively are facing to make the case on how much gender equality is vital. 
So, as I said, let's look for our audience and ask if the audience or the people we serve are at the same level, um, uh, are at the same level. And also, are we targeting each time the elite or really we are uh, targeting the majority and working for the majority? My second question would be how to unleash everybody's emotional intelligence to support them in reaching the next level of development, if ever it's possible. And thirdly, how to operate a paradigm shift advocacy work in order to open a conversation with most stakeholders about embodying the values rather than just speaking about values, values such as compassion, equality, and stewardship. So this is the spiral dynamic with its eighth level of development. But as I said, I um, took the liberty of uh, um, really making it much more easy and only concentrating on the sixth level to be able to answer a few questions that I have. So the six level are uh, those level, uh, the individual, the family, the tribe, the state, the humanity and the cosmos. This is, and each one of us uh, is at one level of, of those. So the individual level uh, is um, concerns people who are extremely egocentric, very much focused on, on that level. Uh, and the same goes for family level. Uh, I will not um, explain much more because what concerns me, what I'm interested in is much more, first of all, the tribal level. And by tribal level, it's any type of identity, any type of uh, people feeling like people feel uh, that uh, the most important thing is their religion. So they will identify themselves as Muslim or as Christian or even by any faith, uh, Buddhist or Hinduist, or by denomination, they will be uh, much more Sunni uh, versus Shia or uh, Orthodox, Catholic and Protestant, or by, they would say we, the Arab nation, uh, it can be the white supremacy or uh, the black uh, supremacy, the uh, Republican versus Democrat, the left versus the right, um, and all of this identity is fine if, of course, we don't go to the extreme of people trying to exclude all the others. So the next stage is, of course, the state, modern states, where people in their development believe in the constitution, the separation of power, the legislation, the citizenship, anything, any institution that makes it a, a modern state where people are equal because all of them are citizens. For people who are at the humanity level, they are equal no matter different they are. These are the people who, uh, of course, believe in uh, international instruments, in international conventions, treaties of human rights. Uh, you have the CEDO, all the human rights convention there. And the last stage is the Cosmos one where we have of course, animals' rights, we had the environment, climate change, and all of this. So this is very briefly, little bit, the stages, because in every stage, we are speaking about a set of values and meanings that we learn since childhood, and they are really entrenched in the very consciousness of every individual, any one of us. It represents the unwritten legislation, the unwritten constitution, really that rules social interaction among citizens and that forms the foundation of social order, like a rock that gets cemented over generation. And it does need time to change, to evolve, and eventually transform to a higher stage on the road to human progress. So to be able to examine those assumptions and eventually to do a reframing, we need first to develop the ability to see the invisible factors influencing, influencing our actions and see the consequences of those actions on one hand, and also to recognize the collective blind spots in our society and turn them into possibility for emergence and empowering actions. So as I said, that we focus only on three uh, levels of development, the tribal one, state and the humanity because most of the people 
uh, we work with or we serve, depending on where we are, are essentially there. Of course, in some countries, even the cosmos level will be there. So first of all, we have, if we want uh, really to, to work with them, we have to distinguish where everybody is. So individual and communities are at different levels of their development, first of all. Then we need to adapt our advocacy, speech, tools, material, strategies, you name it, according to these levels and not according to the classical group, grouping we are used to work with, like civil society, faith-based organization, parliamentarian, state institution, media, academia, private sector, multilateral agencies, and so on and so forth. And I think that we should never underestimate the loyalty that each person has to the set of values and beliefs he or she possesses and to his or her level of development. So if we focus on, um, uh, on that level, we will see that most communities are at the tribal level. I mean, most of the communities I know of, as I said, most of the Arab region, all of them and the African countries. And their loyalty goes to their beliefs, social norms and cultures. And they see even their national legislation and ratified instruments as kind of imposed when it comes, of course, I'm talking about gender equality and the human rights, as imposed by Western countries and influenced by that country. So even the ratification by their parliament, they are supposed to be their member of parliament that they elected, but not really. So even that ratification of the international treaties is not enough for them to accept and implement, let alone to request the harmonization of their legislation accordingly. So most of those countries copied their national legislation on the former colonizer. However, when it comes to family law or certain penal code, they are based on their religious precept. And uh, for Muslim, let's say it's the Sharia law, for, uh, which makes it that there is a coexistence in the same legal system of many countries of, uh, of the region I spoke about. In the same legal system, we will find customary law, religious law, and statutory laws. So there is no way we can speak about gender equality even though it is affirmed in every single national constitution. The reality is completely different. And this explains also why all those countries, before adopting treaties such as CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, they will always have reservations, with few exceptions, of course. So uh, the reservations are usually about sexual and reproductive health and rights, the freedom in marriage, in divorce, inheritance rights, nationalities, and a few other examples. So believing that the people who work at the state level are loyal to it, it's counterproductive. Because in reality, when you deal with magistrates, I did many, many training to many magistrates in the whole Arab region, or with police, any law enforcement teachers, their loyalty goes to really their belief rather than the fact that they belong to the state level. And even some multilateral agencies are also, the personnel are loyal to their culture, not to the UN or human rights and gender principle. And this is why they would have an ambivalence, ambivalent discourse. So, um, so uh, excuse me, beyond the adoption and ratification, of the, the, the international Con uh, convention, it is the ownership by communities of those legislation that count most. And we see it in the, the countries that let's say criminalized female genital mutilation or when it comes to LGBT rights, in fact, uh, or even the difficulties to enact anti-domestic violence laws because all these people see this as against their religion. So this is the issue they are facing. In addition, we would find in many UN instruments, such as treaties or um, declaration, always, you know, this sentence that they would say it has to be adapted to the culture of the country. And here there is, of course, a disconnect and the question should be asked, are we compromising on human rights? What does this mean? And why do we continue hiding behind the respect of the culture? Uh, I have nothing against any culture. I respect all culture. but. 
when those cultural or those tradition and so social norms are violating women's rights, then I have issue with that. Um, and, uh, and this is why if we all agree that women's rights are universal, we must adopt a zero tolerance stand to culture that embody inequality and inequity. There is also an issue with, uh, in the Muslim world is that with the word equality, because equality doesn't exist in holy text, the word. And this is why they would always prefer that in all the, the conven convention or whatever we speak about justice, because it is in there. So this is also one of the issue they have. Another issue, maybe it's uh, empowerment. Uh, the word empowerment, we all understanding the same way, however, the political Islam, by using tamkin, which is much more a brainwashing of women and youth and all the extremist group, when they translated it, they make empowerment. So this is really, for me, an issue with all the donor agencies that think that they are funding empowerment of women while, in fact, they are funding something else. So to conclude all of those points and some of them, I think that also currently we are witnessing a lot of backlashes and hostile reaction against gender equality. And I think really it's time to think differently, to design differently, and to dream, write, and speak also differently. So if we agree that gender is about the power relationship between men and women, I would like to ask a question, maybe a little bit provocative. Have we ever been serious about challenging this power relationship? Because like Mandela, to deny people their human rights is to challenge their very humanity. So thank you so very much for your attention. Hadija, that was truly astonishing. That, that really, really made me think um, a, a, a huge amount about the, the, certainly about the countries that I've worked in. I, I mean, I, I could really, um, I could really, I, I, I've spent a lot of time uh, uh, working in, in Pakistan, including in Baluchistan, and I, I could very much, um, hear where you were coming from, but um, let, let me pass over to, um, to, to the audience and see if there are um, any questions. And while, whilst we're waiting for questions to come in, I, I've got a, a question for you, and I guess it's the million dollar question, is given what you've said, um, that, that essentially, we have had a misunderstanding of the nature of, um, of where we're trying to act and what we're trying to, to do differently. I think the million dollar question is, is what do we do instead? What, what, what has worked in, in your extensive experience? When have you seen a program or a, an approach or a framing or even a, a discourse that has worked well to address the kinds of questions that, that you're provocatively raising for us all to think about. Okay, thanks Sarah, thanks for this uh, lovely question. My experience, uh, essentially for 10 years working, I was the coordinator for uh, the 20 Arab countries, 20 out of the 22. And because fundamentally I knew that the issue was with the religious discourse, um, as UNDP, uh, it was a UNDP program that we designed as a team to work with religious leaders. It was very important because in fact, all the issue we are having were Having, I was the coordinator for the AIDS response for eight years in, uh, in uh, all Arab countries and then for two years in Kuwait. So the biggest work, the biggest change we've been able to make in the messaging uh, against AIDS was to work with religious leaders uh, from both faith, Muslim and Christian, all denominations. We reached out to so many uh, of them, hundreds of them. We started with their highest level, which is their leadership, 
which is the Sheikh Al Azhar, uh, which is of course the highest, like the Pope of Vatican, that even in Pakistan, in Malaysia, Indonesia is the highest, and the same thing for Christian. And we, when we had the type of conversation and we, and we worked with them on emotional intelligence, and of course we used the radical transformational leadership methodology that have been put in place by Dr. Monica Sharma, who at that time was my director, he came after her. So using that methodology, because without it, we wouldn't have been able to work with religious leaders, because it's not about uh, downloading information and showing them beautiful uh, PowerPoint. They need to have, we need to have the courage and the guts to go to discuss with them really religious texts, and especially to challenge the interpretation because the problem is lies with the interpretation of the extremists those who are the extreme in the tribal stage to discuss to challenge that and then to show uh, the really the beauty the respect that religion or religion are showing to women and to, to do it this way so it took us many many years and we did really uh, finally achieve a lot by having that courage because you know sometimes if you work only with ngos you are preaching to the converted so what change are you going to make and then you face well, sorry for having been that long but if we don't do that and you know in recently in tunisia magistrates uh, sentenced for 30 years just three young gentlemen who were just smoking some uh, whatever shit thing so 30 years can you believe it they were not even injecting uh, the heroin or cocaine why how can we explain that explain that because magistrates are in that extreme tribal thing sorry for having been that long no i, I mean i think i think you one one of the things that you very clearly pointed out is there's actually no simple quick answer to to any of these very deep rooted and very complex problems so please take 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 as long as you need <laughs> so, but, but i'm gonna pose a, a question that has come in that I think really speaks to, to the complexity of the challenge. Um, and it, it, it's a question um, from Gary Darmstadt says, how do we navigate this, this pluralism with, inside a country um, when the informal legal systems that, that you've talked about as being at that, that tribal level um, are founded on the patriarchal structures that don't uphold the constitution of the country, which I think is is it, the, the 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 clash, the the nexus of the clash that that, that you've been talking about. Um, I when you when from the framework and the the level that we're that we're operating in within the commission and as people who have signed up to 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 a belief system in in human rights the supremacy of human rights how do we um, how do we negotiate that 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 terrain between the denial on the basis of culture and informal legal systems um, when what's in place at the national level is a, is a constitution that upholds the, the rights of everybody equally. Okay, thanks for the question. It's a very complex one and my response will be as complex, I am afraid, because again, uh, we, we have to we have to understand many, many things. First of all, when we say it's a constitution and elected I mean, uh, the constitution parliament are, do, uh, are really promulgating constitution and legislation. In many countries where we don't have a real democracy, they do not recognize those uh, member of parliament. This is one thing. Secondly, they are really scared or they think that even if it's ratified, whatever convention, it is imposed from outside. So there is always this thing. So the only way out is, uh, not to think about any project or anything to do it just as a one year because the issue is that whether you work for the UN or for anybody it is always just peace and meal project by one year you cannot change the mentality or the belief of people just because you are offering a workshop or you are writing a beautiful report or, or research to have that type of conversation you need to build trust with people and once you build that trust 
And even in my mind, when I started in 2004, long time ago with the UN, I never um, put my strategy like, like my contract. It's a one year strategy and one year pr uh, work plan. No, because I knew deep inside that it will require a lot of time. And thanks God, I've been there for quite long enough to be able to build that trust and by building that trust and that respect of, of people that you can start changing them because you are challenging their culture. And if they see you as an outsider coming to change, they would refuse it and they would not, and they would just refuse anything. And the discussion that are happening now, every time we are having a, a big treaty or even a declaration, you will have all this uh, problem we are having because they feel that it is imposed. So it has to come from within uh, and you have to, to have everybody on board and together. You know, I spent four years building a trust with uh, religious leaders before being able to invite in the same workshops, media people, parliamentarian and everybody. So if we, we have this long term strategy, then we can, because you know, the backlash, it's not even in our region. I mean, how do you explain in Alabama, they come back, they're banning the right to abortion. I mean, I come from Tunisia, in my country, the right to abortion has been um, guaranteed to women 20 years before France. We got it in the 60s, France got it in 75. So you also have to come from that background of really believing deeply uh, about uh, human rights and gender equality. So Khadija, I, I, I just would like a very quick follow-up question on that actually, which is that, that you know, what, what you've described uh, again and again is, is the, that, that, that there is no simple solution. This is, this is very complex, it's long-term, it's, it's multi-generational in the, in the same way that, you know, belief systems are, as you also described, completely multi-generational. And yet, for those of us that have um, a full-time job working on gender equality, let's say, we're working generally within very short funded timeframes. We're asked to show an, a set of impact indicators that change has happened within the space of three years or five years if you're extremely lucky and it's a generous donor. How do we change the mindset of the people in power within the, within, um, the funding communities? How do we get them to think differently? To, how do we get them to think that actually this is not a simple, short so set of solutions that can be put in place like a magic button that can be pressed? Yeah, by explaining, explaining to them how crucial it is to do things differently. It reminds me one day I was in Morocco, in Marrakesh, Morocco, and I had a chance to be with a parliamentarian from Europe. And those parliamentarians thought in the beginning, in their mind, that the most important thing in Europe, I agree with them, is the right to privacy. So because of the right to privacy, they wouldn't dare go to see the family uh, from Africa or Arab countries who are doing female genital mutilation in Europe. So it is only when explained to them that there is nothing as such like right to privacy because the right that is in front is the highest interest of the child. If it's to protect the child not to get mutilated, to see her genitals mutilated, then there is no right to privacy. And as a professor, a teacher in the schools or medical doctor in Europe or whoever, you have as soon as you suspect that, to go and protect the child. So again, it's about giving them real example by explaining, by building trust and, and ask them if they're really serious about making a difference. Because if you are just there to tick the box or because it's our job or whatever, then we are not, and this is why we are talking about the same thing after 17, 70 years, we've been forever. Till when are we going to talk about gender equality? I dream, is it in my generation? I want to guarantee that my daughters, nobody will ever challenge that. So, yeah. So, Khadija, I've got the last question <laughs> for, for now, um, is that, and it's actually combining two questions, and it's about um, whether you can provide an, a, um, an example 
or, or examples about um, actually addressing men's relationship to power, their social networks, thinking about how men operate within, within social, religious, um, tribal structures, as, as, as you put it, um, that how, how we can use those, um, those frames and relationships um, to engage men in power. Uh, to, to, in order to achieve the, the goals of gender equality that we're, we're talking about. In other words, bringing men into the process rather than always thinking about how we bring women into the process or in addition okay. to thinking about women. Yeah, thank you very much. I am, I've been advocate all my life that it's men and women, it's never only women. And uh, frankly speaking, I don't believe in having it's exactly the opposite. It was very counterproductive the day we concentrated on women's rights, NGOs and empowering women, and we left men alone. It was counterproductive and not useful. So for me, the way I reach men, it was exactly through the religious leaders because of the outreach. Can you imagine that, uh, like say in Sudan, uh, where I work there or in Kuwait. In Kuwait, there are 1 million Kuwaiti, uh, the one million, all of them, every single Friday, they go to the Friday sermon. Uh, I worked with religious leaders that in their mosque can have 6,000 men, or even uh, in, in the biggest mosque of Sudan, up to 20,000 every single Friday. So if you want to reach out to those men and have them, uh, just you have to transform the way that imam, that sheikh, or that priest sees uh, women, you know, I've been one day with one very, very uh, highest level uh, Shia religious leaders. He was very high in rank and and uh, uh, old and everything. After I, I never spoke with him, he just attended the, the workshops I was having. He came back to me and told me, you changed 180 degrees the way I see women I speak. And they change everything, let alone, of course, when we work with about vulnerable groups, because I was working on AIDS and it's about sex and sexuality and sex worker and men having the most taboo subject you can imagine. It was just not easy to have these religious men and women. And because when I talk about religious, I bring women. We have many of them and they reach out to women in their homes and everything. So we have to have this type of um, outreach, biggest outreach, but definitely men are part of the society and it doesn't make any, no sense at all for people who work on gender equality to work with women, doesn't make any sense. We have to have everybody. We are together in the same society. That is a great place to stop. So I'd like to thank very much the, um, the people who've been able to join us on, on YouTube. Um, you can find this, you'll be able to find this recording and the recordings of all our previous seminars on this YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us.